Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello, team, and welcome to Scream Something, Volume 19. My name is Emily, and I am here with my co-host, Producer Neil. Hey, everybody. In Scream Something, Emily and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions for the episodes of Season 4 that were released the last two Thursdays. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes, but our team will be saving our deeper analysis for the full episode breakdowns we have planned after the season finale. Superman, we need your help. <sighs> I've got to find another place to drink coffee. And with that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The titles for this week's episodes are Odyssey of Death and Rescue and Search. Their release dates were May 5th and May 12th of 2022. The in-episode dates were August 27th through 30th and September 2nd through 6th. The directors were Christina Soda and Christopher Berkeley, and the writers were Aaron Sparrow and Charlotte Fullerton. Just in time for your next mission. Episode 21 opens in Bayou Bartholomew, where Madame Xanadu calls Zatanna to tell her that she's had no luck in locating Connor's spirit. And in Salem, Zatanna dons the Helmet of Fate, intent to convince Nabu to help with the situation. After the credits, the Time Sphere team escapes Metron's vault and gets back to New Genesis, but breaks the time sphere in the process. They're now trapped in the present with a Phantom Zone projector in need of recharging. Meanwhile, in Supertown, Forager tells Forager that she'd like to travel back to Earth with him, and it's all very cute, and we're very happy for both of them. Um, Metron then finally explains what's going on with Lorzod, the Phantom Zone projector, and the trapped Kryptonians that are there. Uh, catching everyone up to speed (laughs) and then has our main group split up to investigate the two likeliest places for Lorzad to recharge the projector rocket Orion and several other heroes travel to the boiling lake crater and discover the time sphere team is already there charging up the phantom zone projector and a fight breaks out during which (laughs) several things happen Prepare yourselves! (laughs) Macomb attempts to turn Rocket and Orion against each other through mental manipulation, but fails as Rocket finally understands and accepts Orion. Charging the projector awakens the Promethean that lies beneath Boiling Lake. The Promethean releases a source energy cascade which would devastate New Genesis if not contained. So Green Lantern Tomar Ray jumps into action to funnel the energy out into space, eventually sacrificing himself to save the planet. Tomar Ray's ring then chooses Forager, Mounted Forager, to become the new Green Lantern. Lore opens a portal to the Phantom Zone and attempts to retrieve his father, but is stalled by Flash, and the projector is destroyed by Bioship just as Saturn Girl briefly mind links with Phantom Girl and wakes her up from her coma. Only for Lorzod and company to punch their way into the Bioship, taking Saturn Girl hostage, and to force the others to fly them to safety. In the wake of the battle, Metron gets the broken time sphere. The Green Lanterns and New Gods agree to the treaty with the Justice League. Forager decides to go to Oa, but remain in a long-distance relationship with Forager. And days later, back on Earth, Rocket returns to her son with a better understanding of what he needs. Jay returns to an empty house, and in Salem, Dr. Fate gathers a bunch of magic users to locate Connor's spirit, only to find nothing leading Zatanna to believe that he might not actually be dead. Time for a detective. Yes! The final arc picks up right when Lorzod broke into the Bioship. Bart and Chameleon Boy attempt to subdue the intruders, but fail, and Bioship is forced to fly off with all of them. We then cut to El Paso, where Dick Grayson is performing in Haley's Traveling Circus as Dan Danger. (laughs) And Zatanna approaches him backstage to set up this whole detective thing. (laughs) In Bloodhaven, Zatanna explains the situation and asks Dick to believe Connor's not dead for just 24 hours to figure out what happened to him. Their search leads to them finding out that Bart's gone missing, too, after meeting up with two other teenagers, which leads to asking Superman about the two strangers we actually, as viewers, know to be Saturn Girl and Chameleon Boy. Clark tells them nothing, 
because of reasons. Uh, but their search then leads to the Watchtower, where five inhibitor collars, a space belt, and a Zeta tube power core are all unaccounted for. So now Artemis has joined the search party. <laughs> Uh, Nightwing then finds uh, photo and video evidence from several season three events that link the two strangers to Connor and Bart's cache of stolen supplies. Uh, we, I can't. I needed a comma there. This is me not reading my own gosh dang outline. I know what I meant and I can't read it because I'm bad at my job sometimes. Uh, I'm not bad at my job. <laughs> Nightwing then finds photo and video evidence from several season three events that link the two strangers to Connor and figures out that Bart's cache of stolen supplies suggest an off-world mission, which means it's time to go check in with Rocket, <laughs> which relates the strange events she saw on New Genesis involving the Phantom Zone and a possibly camouflaged bio ship that she saw at the very end there. Nightwing then makes several leaps in logic that are actually all extremely correct, even if he doesn't know it yet. Uh, <laughs> and Zatanna has a plan to prove this theory. In the Phantom Zone, Connor explains what he can remember of his past. That he's the son of Luther, that his family crest is the House of L, that his name is Con L, that he's the half-brother of Superman, the son of Jor-El and Lara L. That he killed Superman, that Krypton ex that Krypton exploded over 40 years ago, that Kal-El was sent to Earth, and that Kryptonians gained superpowers under a yellow sun. Druzad thanks him for killing Kal-El as he claims the House of El were all traitors who prevented him from saving Krypton previously. But after Drew and Ursa step out, Phantom Girl finally reveals that she's woken from her coma and that she and Connor are in danger. On Earth, the team recruits Calder and explains what they've learned so far, culminating in Zatanna, Nightwing, Artemis, Rocket, and Calder all taking part in a ritual to summon Clarion and demand his help in accessing the Phantom Zone. Clarion willingly agrees. No, <laughs> Clarion refuses to help and a fight breaks out. Back on New Genesis, Lorzad discovers the Kaiser Thrall has been taken to Oa and forces Kid Flash to power the bio ship so they can all travel there next. And back on Earth, Zatanna eventually forces Clarion to honor his debt, which he does so by simply not killing them all. But something he says sparks an idea for Zatanna, who tells Nightwing they need to track down the magic school bus. So good. Oh, there's so much. Yeah. So there's very so much. much. Yeah. Both of these episodes back to back. So much to talk about. Let's get into Smaster. Yes. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. I like that. That's your first note. Is what we just said. <laughs> it's so good. I had. I mean, yeah. There's so. <laughs> There's so much. I mean, it's interesting from like, you know, from our perspective, just in the sense that the way everything lined up for us is that we have the conclusion of an arc followed by the start of another arc. So like there's just so much packed into this one. Uh, I feel like more so than any two comboed that we've done. Yeah, especially since this this first one that we're dealing with, the end of the new Genesis arc is so much happening so quickly like as we joked about writing this outline i just had to like sum up 15 minutes of the episode or more than that like 15 20 minutes in like okay what actually happens here because there's so many quick cuts that are like ramping up the tension and doing so much really interesting like pacing stuff with how rapid fire and how tense that whole fight is and everything and i was like what what actually happens here how do i talk how do I, how would i explain this to someone where i'm like 10 million things happen at once and i'm screaming about all of them some random little things we love we love both foragers in this episode oh, yeah. i love them both i love them so dearly i really like the fun little callback of forager using his training from nightwing uh and like acknowledging that like Forger's got martial arts training and he's good at it now. It was cute. It was good. And he's so proud of his friends. <laughs> yeah, and we've seen Mantis beat Forager before, and it's like, but yeah, now I went and trained with Nightwing. You don't stand a chance. 
is so good. That uh, I felt very validated by uh, Forager being like, I'll just go back to Earth. I was like, that was my plan. That's what I said. <laughs> Uh, I like when that happens. I like when <laughs> when after we record an episode, but before people hear it, uh, a thing happens and I'm like, hey. I also like I also like the idea of, of the required discussion shortly thereafter, if that had panned out in that way of, hey, um, foraging rules here on Earth, not quite what you think they are. You can't do that. Um, <laughs> Just, you know. No stealing. We don't steal. Uh, None of that. But speaking of Forager, my note here just says in all capital letters, uh, Forager, Green Lantern, my heart, which I think sums it up pretty well. I think I may have screamed when this episode first premiered because I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. I love this choice for this character. It's so good. And I like I like that they set up the thing right beforehand that telegraphs it. That's her being the only person we've seen on the show who is able to break through the Kaiser yeah. thrall, which is how it's the hand that the ring ends up on. And the first time it happened, I was like, oh, my God, that was a horrible sound. That sounds like it was really bad. But that's you break it. What? Where are we going? Is Forager going to just be the one who wins everything forever? Kind of. Um, Maybe. And just setting up that little small moment that in as it's happening, you don't realize the significance of it until she gets the ring and you're like, oh, because she's the only one with the willpower to have broken out of the Kaiser thrall. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. That's great. And I think you you had a note that I agreed with about the her version of the lantern yes, it being was so, so good. good. Yeah. It's such a nice touch of the idea of like the lantern oath can be shifted based on uh your your people's language and verbal yeah because you have to, words you know you what just I mean. have to mean it in your heart that's what that's like that's the important part the well, spirit the, of the oath not yeah. the letter of the oath well the other thing i, I put in there was it, it's interesting that i and for me personally let's start there you know other people may not enjoy the if have enjoyed tomar ray as much as i did and i know but that's also to say i'm i'm sure there are people that enjoyed tomar ray far more than i did because they have a lot more emotional connection but as someone who doesn't have a lot i still really felt a lot when he died yeah, um, yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then for it to also the 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 ring to pass to someone who was also such a new character it it all just felt really good like the the whole sequence of events um landed really well for me yeah and so much of that is i think the combination of the really great acting with only a couple of lines of conveying that conviction there in that moment combined with the very good structure of the writing for his bit of arc that is making sure that in the episode before we understand that his biggest regret Mm-hmm. is krypton being destroyed so and that just be th- seeming at the point you're like oh that's an interesting bit of character thing okay for the next episode to have the payoff of that being him like no no never never happening i don't care what i have to do we are not letting this ever happen again speaking of emotional co- connection i will take a, a brief moment to say um since our last recording i am halfway done with uh <laughs> green lantern the animated series so <laughs> <laughs> I'm on it. Don't worry, everyone. I know listeners were probably super worried. I'm halfway there. So before season four is over, I promise to have watched all of uh, Green Lantern, the animated series. D- just for further context, I don't think I said this last time. I was so removed from it. I didn't realize it was like a fully CG thing. I thought it was like, <laughs> so yeah, those are my touch points previously. No idea. Yeah, okay. no, it was fully CG, but it was supposed to be CG mimicking the style of like the original like yeah. DC animated universe, but in a CG way. It was a whole thing. Yeah, okay, I can see that. Yeah, because it has Bruce Tim style builds, but CG. Yeah, okay, great. Yep. Yeah, now you know. But um, moving on to other thing by a different different Green Lantern the animated series character, that shot of Kilowog holding. Tomare's body is probably very familiar to people who uh, read a lot of comics or know a lot of comics history stuff because it's a callback to the very famous uh, Death of Supergirl cover by the late, great George Perez. And it's a cover that has been 
homaged so many times over the decades of comic book superhero deaths in film, television, and comics. So if you're like, I've seen that pose, but I didn't know that cover, it's because you've seen something else homaging it, whether it's uh, Batman Death in the Family or any number of other things. <laughs> to the point where earlier this week I was in an antique store, and obviously that means I'm looking through older comic books, and one of them was an homage to this cover from an earlier Legion of Superheroes issue. Yes, they, it is very famous. And it's also, if you're like, well, I know I've never seen any comic book covers or something. And I, this also seemed familiar. It's also because it falls very closely in line with a famous art motif called uh, the Piata. I think that's how you say it. That's a very famous uh, motif in Christian art of mary holding jesus after the crucifixion that gets cited it's a pose there's a famous michelangelo sculpture of it that gets copied and homaged and done a lot in popular culture to the point of like the one that people cite a lot at least in my generation is if you watch avatar the last airbender there is a very famous shot of katara holding ang uh after he has gotten very uh, heavily attacked uh, that looks almost exactly like that statue. If you thought that shot seemed familiar, it's either because you've seen the Death of Supergirl cover or you've watched any bit of pop culture (laughs) from a very long stretch of time. It's a famous pose. But speaking of other Green Lanterns, the setup of a long distance Green Lantern forager and Earth forager relationship is very cute and I'm very here for it. And I, <laughs> I don't know. I just want more of that. I yep. would like more references to them being cute and just having a long distance relationship and her acknowledging she's like, I probably come to Earth. I got the ring now. I can visit. I'm like, good, great, love it. I've got the ring. Earth has four lanterns. I'm sure it'll work out. I'm sure I'll come by. I'll be back. I'm sure I gotta go to training. I gotta I gotta go to a year of Green Lantern College. Uh and then <laughs> once I graduate from my program. Yeah, and then I'll do my Green Lantern externship on Earth. You have the yeah, most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love this. Also related to that, uh, this is a twofold thing. We got uh, Forager apparently really likes Shakespeare, and that's very sweet. I like to think that he read stuff in his English class on Earth and just got latched onto this. Is like, this is good. I like this. Uh, it's very sweet. I would like to read his highlights. I want to know which sonnets and monologues yes. this boy has highlighted. Uh, please give, give me the Forager annotated uh, complete works of William Shakespeare. I would like this. Uh, this also, of course, confirms our our uh, ongoing uh, list of all the books in Young Justice. All of Shakespeare exists in yes. Young Justice. Uh, before I go on to one of my other notes, my continued Forager Shakespeare thing is I will point out, I'll use my theater degree for two, for two minutes. For anyone who didn't know, since it is slightly less iconic than the previous Forager uh, Shakespeare monologue, uh, that we saw in a previous episode that was a the Romeo and Juliet balcony scene. Uh, this one is from Hamlet, and it's uh, Hamlet to Ophelia, if I'm remembering correctly. And for my own my own sanity, uh, I'm going to take this entirely at face value uh, and just say that you know, Forager, who's now a Green Lantern, just she's never read Shakespeare. She doesn't have the context, so that I don't have to think too hard about how that play turns out, and that this is some sort of horrible foreshadowing, like. <laughs> No, we're going to not worry about that. But I have to say it so that uh, if anything does happen, people know that I was already (laughs) worrying about it. (laughs) Yeah, you know, if you haven't read Hamlet, it doesn't turn out well for anybody involved. Um, It's not great. (laughs) Go watch The Lion King and then make it worse uh, in terms of how much happens. (laughs) Also, my other note for this before we move on to the next episode before I... You have more notes, I am sure. Yep. I want to call out the that I laughed extremely hard at uh, Madame Xanadu asking how <laughs> Zatanna convinced Naboo to help and him saying, yes. by swearing she would give us no peace until we complied. And I was just over here like, Zatanna's energy is strongly for one week a month. I am your problem. Uh, and it is incredible. And I love it. <laughs> well, I mean, you I love- called it. I love further confirmation that Zatanna just straight up goes, hey, seven days out of every month, you just have to deal with me. Uh, oh, I was, I was of the mind uh, of also like, oh, no, 
when the seven days are up, I'm not taking this off until <laughs> this is resolved. I do not That is care. an amazing interpretation of that. Oh, yeah. I believe that. I believe that. Uh, <laughs> that is hilarious. So do you have any more notes about uh, Odyssey of Death before we move on to the next? So I can't help but believe that, like, as the, you know, in um, the bayou, Madame Xanadu, as those spirits are passing by, th- obviously they're all named people like that's just my assumption that they have that they're they're it's every ghost from the dc universe well either that or or um homages or or something along those lines like characters we've already seen even if they're background characters something to that effect like i just can't believe that they're not they're not just people that like could be identified by those that that would know that said also like i I've always been wondering, like, what does the space treadmill do? And clearly it lets them go very quickly. But I've been wondering, will it let them time travel or will it not? And I I, I don't know the question. answer to that. But it definitely lets the bioship go very, very fast. <laughs> I did want to say, though, with the ghosts, I thought it was really interesting. Only really noticed this. I probably would have noticed this on a 10 million three watch or whatever, but realized this because of the... Uh, YJ watch party that they did on Twitter, Greg shared the just offhanded comment of the fact that the ghosts were supposed to be that you could only see their reflections, that they were actually supposed to be flying over the river and you were seeing the reflections in the river. And I was like, I didn't get that, but this is very cool. And I may have guessed that on my 10th three watch or something, but that's like, that's a cool, I just assumed, you know, I don't know, ghosts travel via under river or something and yeah. it's like no no they're flying above and we're just seeing them in the reflection i'm like oh that's cool so i'm just throwing that out in case anybody missed the yj watch party i'm sure you can still find all of those tweets um mm-hmm. if you do some searching but it was very fun facts like that fun little things yeah you can search the hashtag and then it was divvied up between greg being on the hbo max account and brandon being on the dc comics account but if you search or the other way around i think it might have been the other way around but yes it was between those two accounts you can find everything you've ever wanted the other one and i only realized like as i'm about to say this that like i'm kind of bummed but like mantis definitely comes in clutch i mean yes screws up the time sphere but come on Mantis didn't know how to operate it, but then immediately figures out where to power up the Phantom Zone projector and is also the only person from the team that gets caught. Mantis <laughs> literally saved the day multiple times for what this what that group has and then also was the, got left behind and caught. But to, to, to be fair, though, he did bring them to a place that caused major problems. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, they pointed out they're like there are several places he could have gone, but he went to the one that caused a volcano. <laughs> no, nah, it's fine. Okay, speaking of volcano, and yeah, I don't know if you've seen my note. Well, I, have, I guess I have two notes. We'll do volcano first. I feel like at the end of the day, the lake is just in that Promethean's mouth, and then also because it is the power, I've it. I'm just kind of grossed out by the whole thing at the end of it. <laughs> Like, it makes me think of Nowhere from the Marvel Universe where they're inside the head of a Celestial still, like, taking parts of it and selling it because it is the, the you know, the bits of a dead god. And then it makes me think that that's, that lake is gross. That's all. Also, that's I fair. like that's Ori- Orion's level of confusion when things are being discussed where he's like, so they're here and they're here right now? Like the way he framed that question was like, okay, I don't get it. I like it, so. Are they here, and is it right now that they're here, not like later or earlier? Like right? Okay, good. Okay, got it. Yeah, no fair, especially because Metron is clearly not explaining anything. <laughs> no, <laughs> not until absolutely required. Oh, and Rocket is just continuing being like, can you can you give us like two seconds of information? He's like, absolutely not. I'm like, please. Please tell them anything. Please. They're so confused. They're so lost. I've been watching all of the episodes, but they haven't. They don't know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like she does have a very good point of just being like, why didn't you put a tracker on it? Why didn't you put you have all of this technology and you didn't put a tracker on it? 
Uh, yeah. And I think his only response, if I'm remembering correctly, because I it's been a day or two since I watched the episode and a lot happens, his response is like, well, it's not that kind of technology because she says, like, it's with all this new Genesis tech and you didn't do this. And he just goes, this thing isn't new Genesis tech. I'm like, that's not a response to what she said. Yeah. <laughs> that's not an answer. No one's ever stolen anything before. I didn't realize this could be a problem. <laughs> also, why did you give him the time sphere, broken or not? I'm like, part of me thinks that they didn't give it to him. He just got there first and took it. And there's also no true. way to fight it. But that, that that's all I have for, for this episode. I'm sure we will have so much more to say when we break these down individually. Oh, yeah. Because so much happens. <laughs> this was a silly note. I will start with my silly note before we dive into all of the other wonderful things of around a rewatch. I had the thought of how much do you want to bet that Bioship has like strong aunt energy toward Macomb, uh, <laughs> being a villain now? Like your sister will be very disappointed in you, young man. Yeah. Yeah, I was supposed to be retired, and now I have to deal with this? This nonsense? No. Because I feel like you can't you can't tell me that Bioship does not know who Makam is. Like, I feel like I feel like she definitely recognizes him and knows on some level of, like, you're, you're my person's brother. What are you doing? Stop being a fool. And, she, and I do like that they have made Bioship a character for this whole bit of both her attacking them and later of her just being like, what if I just shut off? What happens if I just don't? What if I just say no? Uh, I like her trying to help. It's very good. It's very, I love, I love Bioship. I love her getting to do stuff. Um, But also we got, we finally got Dick Grayson back. We finally got Nightwing having, having lines, having some moments we are seeing him do stuff and that's great uh i love seeing dick grayson get to be back in the circus i love that he apparently just is dan danger sometimes yeah. that offhanded yeah. remark from zatanna of just like i get why you come back here every few years and i'm like you're telling me that <laughs> you're telling me that dick grayson just switches jobs all the time and every couple of years it's like what if i go run away with the circus again <laughs> Yeah, like valid as a person who also circuses valid. It is a mood, but very funny. And speaking of that c- circus scene, uh, we fu- we got to see Ty and Asami again. That was yeah. nice. Like I know it's such a small moment, uh, and they're all of the people in that shot are it's Tracy thirteen and mm-hmm. Jaime and his uh, his parent his mom and Ty's granddad. I think are the total people in that scene along with Ty and Asami. But Ty and Asami were the ones I wasn't expecting, which was why it was so fun to see yeah. them. It's very nice. Knowing they're okay. Knowing they're still friends. No, I have, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, knowing they're still friends. Uh, <laughs> so, other things, larger things. Again, this is an episode where 7 million things happen, so I'm going through randomly. And so many of my notes are just about very specific small scenes because... The overall thing of the episode is just, I really enjoyed this episode. It was very fun. It was very cool getting to see our whole team back together, our original team back together. It was great seeing them piece together all the information we have, but in a way that is fun and interesting and makes those pieces fall into place without it feeling like info that we're like having to slog through. Like it doesn't feel like an info dump. It feels like just fitting all these pieces together in a way that is fun and entertaining because you're so invested in the character interactions surrounding it. So really loved that. And speaking of character interactions, I am always forgetting during this season how much I miss certain things from earlier seasons until we get to see them again. Like I said, I didn't realize how much I missed Cheshire until Cheshire was Mm -hmm. actively being a part of the story again. I did not realize how deeply I missed getting to see Zatanna and Dick Grayson interact uh, until this episode and having every single one of their scenes make me smile way too much. Um, (laughs) I have dubbed their uh, dynamic in this episode as just being like the very stage kid vibe of platonic flirtation with no intention to date. And I am absolutely here for whatever chaos these two are in. It is very fun. I enjoy it. I personally, until proven otherwise, my headcanon is that uh, Nightwing and Barbara are still together, but this is just how Zatanna and Dick Grayson are, and oh, yeah. everyone is fine with it. Everyone's like, "Yeah, that's just that's just how they communicate." <laughs> yeah, because 
Because and you know, it came up and I, I've seen it where is it too far? Is it not too far? And the only people that can answer that question are the two people potentially in a relationship. And that would be Dick and Barbara. And then, of course, Zatanna. But like I, I, there was no overt lines that were crossed, in my personal yeah. opinion. So but the, the, the most interesting thing is, I mean, and you, you hinted at it, like, I guess we're not 100 percent sure that he and Barbara are still together. Only because we have not seen them Again, there's together. nothing like, overt. Yes. Yeah. Like he mentions Barbara. He talks about how she's better at hacking yeah. than him. There's and there's there there seem there's no weird vibe to that comment in this episode, which is why no. I'm like, they're probably still together. I have no reason to think they're not. I feel like with the way that the show handles relationships, if they weren't together and it mattered that we knew they weren't together, we would know they're not together. The show this like if you think back to season two, this show informs us that in season two, the show informed us that Superboy and Miss Martian had broken up within the first like two minutes of the premiere yeah. of season two because we're like, we need you to know. <laughs> we're not gonna we're gonna we're gonna lie about this kind of thing. But who knows? I don't. My headcanon for now until proven otherwise is that him and Barbara are still together. We'll see. I feel like we'll I feel like, I don't know why. I just feel like we'll know by the end of the season. Like I feel like eventually we will see them in a scene together yeah again i'm just like thinking about like where i think this season is going and what scenes are likely to happen i'm like if there is a big whole team and league reunion i feel like we will see these two characters interact all of that is speculation but this is this is me just whatever relationship status anyone is in i enjoy seeing zatanna and nightwing interact they're fun. They have a good dynamic. I like seeing the way that they keep up with each other. It is very fun. Uh, <laughs> highlight of this episode. Oh, yeah. And the biggest interesting reaction was when she specifically says, I need a detective. Like, I, I, I can't quite figure out how I feel about the look on his face. It was just like, ah. And I mean, <laughs> that's almost the noise you felt. It was yeah. Like, you're interrupting my circus time. Uh, or like, what? <laughs> like, I can't. She's like, no, no, it's okay. 24 hours, that's all I'm asking for. Yeah. It's he's a little surprised and confused, and it's kind of like the show has kind of hinted at the stuff about like Nightwing has kind of been pulling back further and further from the superhero stuff over time, I feel like, in a lot of ways. Like not quite and not entirely, but even in season three, they talked a bit about like how like he'd taken time off and he'd pulled away from doing stuff and he kept and then he was only doing covert undercover stuff and all of those things. So having Zatanna just show up and be like, hey, I, I need Robin Detective Boy Wonder back for a minute. And him being like, OK, I guess. I guess so. <laughs> Other little random things. Amistad is when we see Amistad at Rocket's apartment, he is wearing an icon sweatshirt. Yes. And that is very cute. I like that. I like that detail. I've always found it amusing that Young Justice acknowledges that there is in-universe merch for... <laughs> in yes. universe superheroes but it's very nice seeing him wear that one uh and the yj watch party also had a reference of either greg or brandon calling it out and mentioning that icon is amistad's favorite superhero so i'm like oh yeah. that's cute that's sweet yeah and then having the having the that team photo in the house or in the apartment yeah. that's really nice touch as well everybody has a copy of that photo. yeah i love it <laughs> everyone on the everyone in that photo has a copy of that photo and i like it but also other random little thing in this scene, because I saw various people talk about it on Twitter with either a level of confusion or intrigue. Artemis has a line in that scene where she says, you two dated him uh, to Zatanna and Rocket. And people were yeah. like, what? Wait a bit. I'm like, if you were confused by that line, then you haven't read the Young Justice tie-in comics and you should get right on that. Pick mm -hmm. them up at your local bookstore or comic book store, order the graphic novels or read them on DC Universe Infinite. I think they're all still there. Yep. Uh, the invasion arc, Yeah, because the invasion arc, those last uh, five, six, those last six issues uh, that were set right before invasion also are the are the first reference that we ever got in canon to the fact that apparently at some point Dick Grayson and Raquel dated. Uh, yeah. My brain has always thought briefly, like I was like, I don't think that was a serious ongoing thing in comparison to some of the other love interests Nightwing has had. Yeah. But we have very little other context beyond <laughs> these couple of things. People are like, <laughs> yeah, you two dated. Remember that? <laughs> so yeah. If you if you were caught off guard by that line, 
read the tie-in comics, find out yeah. other random things about these characters. Other notes include Nightwing's conspiracy theory board is a masterpiece. Yes. <laughs> I love it with my whole heart. It is apparently both a reference to the very common uh, fictional pop culture trope of like a conspiracy theory board, the red string and bush pins, but uh, was also at least partially a joke about the uh, fact that the Young Justice team does use index cards to plot out the complicated plots of seasons which is why like i thought when i rewatched it and paused it some of the index cards are like different colors and if you've ever seen any of the photos of the of like greg and brandon standing in front of those like wall of index cards they're color coded and (laughs) neatly organized and it was very funny i yeah i legitimately thought how close are some of those note cards to the note cards that were used to build the season. I mean, I, there's no way that some of them aren't. I would assume some of them are like identical. And of course, others are created for the episode itself. But I also loved when there's that there's one shot where you see the whole board and it's a relatively quick shot and you cannot read all of it in like the time it's on screen. But if you go back and pause, reading through that board is very funny because I really like the ways in which certain cards have stuff that has been written and then crossed out and then something else has been written. Like there's an early one at the very top that says like something like Connor and Bart both missing connection question mark. And then that's later crossed out and in larger letters written next to it connected exclamation point (laughs) exclamation point i did not catch this that's it's, awesome it's great and a lot of them have that kind of thing of something where uh someone one of their group has clearly like written down a theory and then crossed it out later and gone like wait no tweak it tweak it a little bit <laughs> we were almost there so close uh it's great other stuff this is such a this is such a fun episode but Clarion and Zatanna's mutual frustrated, tired antagonism is very fun. And I love that that is their dynamic that we have been playing out this season that we keep seeing that like for all that this season has done a lot to establish Clarion as like very genuinely dangerous and very genuinely a lot more (laughs) gruesome and aggressive than we had seen him in previous seasons. It is also very entertaining that despite that, despite seeing all of that, his and Zatanna's relationship that was also referenced in uh, the the magic arc that we saw, like when they when he shows up and both he and Zatanna both scream, what did you do at each other? Like, <laughs> who yep. broke the universe this time? Uh, and when he shows up here trying to be like terrifying demon creature and then cuts himself off halfway through to be like, oh, it's you. I'm tired. What do you want? Who dare summon Claire? Oh, it's, yeah, it's the witch girl. Thanks. Here I am. I love it. I love that that's their, their dynamic. It's wonderful. Uh, and <laughs> I, I would want, as I think we've joked before, I'm like, I would read like a whole, I would read a whole spinoff that's like Zatanna's weird magic adventures. Uh, <laughs> and like, this is why. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And it surprises me none at all that Clarion was immediately or previously aware of where Dr. Fate is. Yeah. I feel like as chaotic as Clarion may be, that is maybe one thing that is always like kept track of. Where is Dr. Fate currently? Yeah. Um, I should be aware of that. And this is an observation. This is not something I can prove as far as I can tell, but this is an observation about one of the interesting choices they made here that while Zatanna's spells are always um, actually read backwards by Lacey Chabert, by her voice actor, and you can hear it, you can hear that this is someone reading a thing that is backwards. Clarion's spell in this episode, like when he actually does a backwards spell in response to some of Zatanna's, at least to my ear, sound like they're actually reversed audio, or at least like they have some reverb or distortion or something put on them to make them sound closer to the way that like, if you have ever played an audio backwards, you know that sound that they have that sounds just off enough. And I think it's a very interesting like sound design touch to put on that, whether it is just straight up reversed or if they're just editing the audio to make it sound more like it is because it makes him sound more otherworldly and creates that cool distinction between their spell casting. And I really like it. I'm just throwing that out there. I can't prove it because I don't know <laughs> how I would, but it's it sounded like that to me and I liked it. 
Yeah, I I assume there is a way to make it sound like that. I just don't know if I've ever heard anything that's not that that still sounds that close that isn't just actually reversed audio. Yeah, because yeah. it's so distinct in the way, and, th- and then that's why the like when Zatanna does her spells, that's why it comes across so differently because it doesn't have those those weird like audio artifacts to you're like oh, okay yeah that that's backwards i know that's backwards i've heard backwards before and it's so distinct so i'd be i mean i'm definitely going to try and figure out if there's a way to do it believe you me <laughs> uh, i hope so other things oh i do have here the very brief joke of Zatanna, why didn't you do that first? Uh, when she, at the very end, does wonderfully force him into like the, in the name of the sacred balance or whatever, you have to do this. And I'm being like, okay, fine. I guess I'll honor my debt. But I'm like, Zatanna, why didn't you open with that? If you had that, yeah. please. <laughs> like before he steps out of the circle, when asking nicely didn't work, just please immediately jump to the spell that does the thing. <laughs> please immediately jump to invoking the counterbalance, the uh, sacred balance, rather than having a whole fight scene. But I get that it's a superhero cartoon, and we gotta have a fight scene. So final thing here is. I do. I know a lot of people. All of us are finding. I watched this whole episode the entire time, being like, okay. When are you calling on McGann in this list? I get that you are slowly assembling the team. When are you calling on McGann? Uh, I'm with Zatanna handing Nightwing the card that's like Magic School Bus. I'm like, we are one step closer to my absolutely <laughs> ridiculous meme of a theory of just everybody yep. pulling up to McGann's house. Like, get in, losers. We're saving Connor. No explanation. We are all in a bus. Get on. <laughs> woo woo. Get in, losers. We're saving Connor. And yeah, like, do I also watching this episode completely understand why they are not telling McGann until seemingly the last minute? Yes, I get that giving her false hope in this particular situation would be absolutely awful and break her. But I need somebody to go tell her, please, someone tell her, let her help. (laughs) Please, someone call McGann. Because also, because the other thought is, like, if you don't call McGann, and and you also succeed, what the heck are you going to do to show up on McGann's oh, doorstep yeah. now with Connor and just go, so we didn't tell you what we were doing, <laughs> but look who we found. And I don't yeah. know which would be like worse for a person. <laughs> like, hey, you want to come on this mission? Or we didn't invite you to come on this mission, but it succeeded. <laughs> Here's your boyfriend you didn't get to help save. Well, the other version is we went on this and it didn't work. That would, like, I'm like, yeah, if that's what ha- if that. Yeah. If you're worried about that happening, what do you do? Do you all make a f- five person pact of like, we never speak of this again to McGann? Do we do that thing that we kept doing in other seasons? <laughs> Everybody's like, we don't tell this one person this thing yeah. the rest of us know. <laughs> uh, I'm like, that's a dangerous, dangerous thing to do, everybody. But only time will tell. Only time will tell how this will turn out. So do you have any more notes on this episode? There's also the whole mini Phantom Zone arc in this episode that I don't even have any notes on because it's just so much. Uh, But go ahead. I'm sorry. I cut you off. I'm just. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so with the the entire lore dump, haha, always funny. But it was interesting because, again, it didn't it, it, it just felt like what it was. And it's also interesting to see where connor is it's and it's just rough to experience where he is but then also to attribute and you know dick brings it up that he spent months there and zod also brings it up of like no 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 still be careful this this individual is fragile their mental state is is something to be careful with just because of what they've experienced so far so it's in- it, yeah, it's really interesting, but also a bummer. Also, Phantom Girl is very awake now because like at one point she's laying there and like I didn't catch it until the rewatch. Her eyes are open during some of the like dialogue back and forth. So then when like Ursa <laughs> runs over and like grabs Connor, she like closes her eyes. I'm like, how did they not see that? Okay. They're paying attention to Connor and the things Connor has to say. Yes, they're they're very focused on what he is relaying and they're bummed out by that that brand new news that no it's been probably like 40 years and krypton blew up 
So. Yep. Also, my only note that I have written down is Calderbeard. <laughs> Apparently, Wind really likes it. And I'm like, I like it too. So. It's good. It's good. Let me have it. Oh. So with all that, is it time to, to crash some boats? It is, because we almost crashed it momentarily, so we should jump over there. Superboy, are you alright? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. <laughs> so, in Crashing the Mode, we will be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of recording. So this Crashing the Mode is based on episodes 1 through 22, and the trailer, Let's Go. So yeah, do your first one, because it gives me a few of mine. Okay, so... I had this note that I kept thinking as Connor was doing, said Lord Dump, that we discussed. How much uh, do you want to bet that Connor's info dump here is what inadvertently leads to Druzad's whole, let's move to a galaxy with a yellow sun and overthrow the galaxy thing? Because, yeah, as Connor was saying that and hearing the way he reacted of like, oh, we get power from a yellow sun. Things started to click in my brain about the story that the Legionnaires tell about uh, what Drew Zod did and everything. And I was like, yeah, there wouldn't be a reason that he'd know that. Superman only knows that because he's on Earth. Uh, yeah. And yeah, Kryptonians don't have powers when they're on Krypton. They're just people with no superpowers but seemingly based on after he got out and he was put on another planet like krypton went no no this isn't right we're supposed to be able to fly in things and i'm like who told him that connor told him that whoops uh so much of that info dump was my brain being like connor no connor stop connor you're setting up the villains connor no you're setting up the plot stop it well, and I also think of, yeah, like, what is the ultimate shakeout of these events for these timelines? Because Saturn Girl brings it up like, you messed up. Yeah. You blew up, the, you blew up the projector. How does any of your plans work at any point now? It doesn't work later. It doesn't work now. But I also think of like, yeah, but even if it did work now, like, what did that look like? If you had Druzad get out right now, does what does your existence, what, how... Because that's a thousand years later. So now do you, but you didn't bring your mom out. So then is it, I don't, you know, so yeah, time travel is great. It's, it's what, as she points out, as uh, as you said, a Saturn girl points out where she's like, you won, you won and you tried to go back in time and win better. And that's, and you've messed it all up, Yep, (laughs) which is just wild. Speaking of the phantom zone. Will we have like a huge meeting finale together in the Phantom Zone at some point? That's a good question. Because you have Team Time Sphere plus Team Time Travel all headed to Oa, which Oa and (laughs) which also like, how does that work? Like as tough as it was for for all of you at Supertown, how does going to Oa pan out? I mean, maybe we'll see because... I'm like, that's that's where the Green Lanterns come from. Okay. This is how we, <laughs> this is how we save Aya somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So this is, yeah, like this is how we this is how we wrap up the plot of Green Lantern the animated series in a different show. <laughs> no, I don't actually think that's gonna happen. No, no, but no. Yeah, so that is my thought of like how does that all pan together? Or yeah, how many people how many people end up in the Phantom Zone? Is yeah. my ultimate question. And how many people end up out of the Phantom Zone? <laughs> only time will tell. Uh, it's one of those things where we're at the point where there's only only a handful of episodes left in this season, and it's really like all of our crashing the modes are like, how's it going to end? <laughs> What's yeah. going to happen? <laughs> like we're like we don't even have like super like concrete predictions because we're like I don't know. It relies on a lot of other factors right now, guys. Yeah. It's um, mm-hmm. my other note here for crashing the mode to throw out is. Uh, who do we think's inside the Kaiser Thrall? Because that sure was a credit scene to end on to just go, ah, there's a person in this. That's wild. Uh, I sat there kind of staring into the middle distance for a minute like, oh, no. Yeah, there's a person. There's an Earth person. There's an Earth person child. An 11 year old Earth person. So I know I'm personally, I know a lot of people are thinking that it's probably one of like the many 
vague unnamed kids who have been caught up in the metahuman trafficking plot and all that. But I have no idea who in particular. Yeah, and in the in the same vein that clone is always an option. <laughs> it's just it's just true. That's an option, um, especially when you think of like how fast um, Connor was, you know, grown into you know, his current and permanent age of 16 <laughs> forever 16. So the options are limitless. Also, I wonder if long term we'll be able to figure out like what those tones were, what they meant um, at the end, because there are there's like feedback from the Kaiser Thrall basically of whoever may or you know the consciousness of whoever's in there trying to communicate yeah and we had one more thing we wanted to say from fandom zone stuff that was we have our first reference to the possibility of supergirl existing in this universe yes somewhere in the in theory now in the theory name, fully the in name, theory yeah the name kara has not been used but a reference to her her direct lineage and you know her her named parents having a daughter would easily lead a person to believe that Kara would be that person, but again, until the unnamed ninja becomes Jason Todd, they're just an unnamed ninja. So <laughs> that wild, uh, that wild feeling of like this show where everyone is someone from comics, it would be absolutely wild to be like, yeah, they had a daughter, and it's not the one you're thinking of. <laughs> would be a wild choice of like it makes it makes me laugh so i'm just i just mean in general principle it would be hilarious i would i would be very happy (laughs) but i agree it's the it's the unnamed ninja principle Mm -hmm. but that's all the mode i have to crash same here and with all of that i think we can zeta out of the watchtower Thank you all for spending some time with us here today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crash in the Mode, on Tumblr at TheYJFiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that somehow is not enough for you, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. And you can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and or someone else, an enemy. No, no. <laughs> sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. Ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have a lot harder time finding those. And if you are able to support us monetarily and would like to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.